COVID-19 has brought unprecedented challenges regarding the ability to generate timely evidence, all while this pandemic overwhelms hospitals and healthcare workers. About 5% of patients with COVID-19 require admission to the intensive care unit and mechanical ventilation. Based on the recent epidemiological models, COVID-19 is going to hit all the areas in this country. So the surge is coming and not just to the hotspots like New York City. With every ICU in this country preparing for the surge, there are a number of changes that intensive care units are making, including ours. We're preparing anesthesiologists who are not critical care medicine trained and also nurse anesthetists to help us manage patients with COVID-19. Even though they're not critical care medicine trained, we have a lot of overlap of knowledge, especially when it comes to managing ventilators. And we have a lot of overlap with certain procedures. By allowing anesthesiologists and nurse anesthetists to help in this manner, it will help other intensivists like myself handle the surge of patients coming our way. And because they're helping us, that's the main reason for me making this video, so that they can watch this and be better equipped to handle the surge with us. And this video is intended for any healthcare provider out there who has the potential to care for critically ill patients with COVID-19. And if you're not a healthcare worker, most of the info in this video will probably be too technical for you to understand, but feel free to watch it anyway. So in this video, I'm gonna cover the most important aspects of caring for a critically ill patient with COVID-19 and how to manage different scenarios. The info in this video is based on several things. One, what we know so far about COVID-19 patients, mainly from studies that were done in China. Two, standard care for critical care patients in general. And three, my experience and the experience of many of my colleagues of caring for critically ill patients. Knowing and implementing all of the info in this video does not guarantee you save a COVID-19 patient's life in the ICU, but it will give you the best chance of doing so. So let's get to it. If a patient with COVID-19 is coming to your ICU, they most certainly have pneumonia and they probably have acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS. They may or may not be in shock, which often happens in patients with ARDS and in patients with sepsis in general. Patients with severe disease who require ICU admission are likely to have high oxygen requirements. Although both high flow oxygen and non-invasive positive pressure ventilation have been used for COVID, the safety of these is uncertain and they're considered aerosol generating procedures that warrant specific isolation precautions. The same goes for nebulized treatments such as duonebs. Most patients who require ICU admission have ARDS and they'll likely have a better outcome if intubated sooner rather than later. That's another reason why it's likely better to skip high flow oxygen and non-invasive positive pressure ventilation and jump straight to intubation. COVID-19 patients often have rapid clinical deterioration and there needs to be a low threshold to intubate once their oxygen requirements start to climb. ARDS is a clinical diagnosis based on non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema with bilateral patchy infiltrates on chest imaging and a PO2 to FiO2 ratio of less than 300. In ARDS, there's a crazy chaotic inflammatory response within the lungs with damage to the alveoli and surrounding capillaries, which leads to excess protein and fluid accumulation in interstitial and alveolar spaces. That means decreased lung compliance, increased VQ mismatch, and increases in shunt and dead space ventilation. Patients with ARDS are at a high risk of mortality, which increases with ARDS severity. With that said, mortality is usually the result of the underlying disease that triggered ARDS in the first place, rather than refractory hypoxemia. The severity of ARDS is important because it's going to determine how we manage patients with ARDS. And severity is determined by the PO2 to FiO2 ratio. Mild ARDS is a PO2 to FiO2 ratio between 200 to 300, moderate is 100 to 200, and severe is less than 100. With ARDS, the alveoli fill up with protein and fluid. This leads to at least partial alveolar collapse and decreased lung compliance with shunt physiology. This is why having a high PEEP is crucial, meaning a high positive end expiratory pressure. Increasing the PEEP minimizes repeated opening and closing of the distal airways and alveoli. It also improves homogeneity of the lung parenchyma by reducing drastic differences in regional lung compliance. It also improves VQ mismatch and shunt physiology by maintaining alveolar recruitment. You're essentially popping open as many collapsed alveoli as possible. So what is the ideal level of PEEP? No one knows for sure. 
Typically for ARDS, we set the PEEP between 10 to 15 when we first intubate someone, sometimes all the way to 20 if they have severe disease. You don't want to go too high though, because the higher you go, the more likelihood of pneumothorax. So here's a table from the ARDSNET trial that gives us a suggested PEEP and FIO2 strategy. Just remember that the more severe the ARDS, the more PEEP you're going to want to have, generally speaking. So increasing the PEEP pops open alveoli and improves oxygenation, and that's great. Using low tidal volumes is the other key to managing ARDS patients, as this has been shown to improve mortality. Current ARDS goals include both a tidal volume of 6 mils or 6 cc's per kg of predicted body weight and maintenance of the lowest possible plateau pressure. Specifically, you want to maintain that plateau pressure of less than 30. So when it comes to tidal volumes, that's going to mean typically on average around 300 range for women of average height and 400 range for men of average height. But giving a patient low lung volumes is not typically comfortable for the patient. So it's important to properly sedate patients in order to accomplish our lung protective strategy of low lung volume ventilation. And because of this, they're going to develop a respiratory acidosis. It's called permissive hypercapnia. That's the sacrifice we make in order to achieve our ultimate goal, which is survival. Now let's talk about some other things that you can do for patients with ARDS. Recently, the PROCEVA trial demonstrated improved mortality in ARDS patients with a PO2 to FIO2 ratio of less than 150 who were treated with early prone positioning and low tidal volume ventilation. So why is prone positioning so beneficial? When we lay in a prone position, the weight of the heart no longer compresses the posterior lung regions, and this allows for improved VQ matching. Also, with positive pressure ventilation, the diaphragm moves more freely in the prone position, which means better chest wall compliance and better gas exchange in the lower lung fields. To get the maximum benefit, proning should be done for 16 hours a day, although at least 12 hours would be the minimum. Sometimes with ARDS, it's so severe that despite all those things that we just mentioned, they're still hypoxic. Sometimes in those cases, we do inverse ratio ventilation or we do APRV, airway pressure release ventilation. A few years ago, we looked at doing high frequency oscillatory ventilation, but that didn't prove to be beneficial in adults. Corticosteroids such as methylprednisolone, aka solumedrol, if given early for severe ARDS, may improve ICU length of stay and number of days on mechanical ventilation. These studies were based on ARDS patients before COVID-19 came about. The idea here is that steroids suppress the inflammation that occurs in the beginning phase of ARDS. There was recently a retrospective non-peer-reviewed report of 46 COVID-19 patients who had severe pneumonia, and 26 of those patients were treated with methylprednisolone, specifically 1 to 2 milligrams per kilogram per day for 5 to 7 days, and that was associated with a reduction in duration of fever and the need for a supplemental oxygen. So right now, the recommendation is to give COVID-19 patients steroids only if they have ARDS. Neuromuscular blockade, such as with cystatricurium or Nimbex, is sometimes used for severe refractory or life-threatening hypoxemia, especially if there's severe ventilator dyssynchrony. There's not enough evidence to definitively say that there's a mortality benefit of using pyrolytics. And the downside to using them is that patients can develop critical care illness myopathy or neuropathy. So only use neuromuscular blockade if absolutely necessary if they have vent dyssynchrony. Inhaled nitric oxide is a pulmonary vasodilator, but it's not routinely done for adults with ARDS because although it usually improves oxygenation, it's not been shown to reduce morbidity or mortality. But if you're maxed out on your vent settings and the patient is still hypoxemic, then give it a try. Critically ill patients with COVID-19 often develop septic shock, which is a form of distributive shock. And for shock, we give IV fluids and face suppressors. But ARDS patients generally do better when you keep them in the dry side, so in a negative fluid balance state. So if you have a COVID-19 patient who's in shock and ARDS, what should you do? Based on my experience of treating ARDS patients who are in shock, my recommendation would be to use minimal fluid possible and start vasopressors early. In my experience, patients tend to respond better to albumin compared to crystalloids, especially if they have low albumin levels. Either way, you're going to want to assess fluid resuscitation responsiveness, and if they don't respond well to fluids, then just stick with the vasopressors. First line vasopressor is always going to be norepinephrine, aka levofed, with second line being vasopressin, especially if they're tachycardic. What about a central line? Do you really need to get a central line in? 
Not only does inserting a central line expose more healthcare workers to the virus, but it also entails using more PPE. So hopefully patients don't need a central line. Sometimes you can run a presser through a peripheral IV. You can get away with doing so if one, your peripheral IV is relatively large gauge, two, your peripheral is not extremely distal, so if you have an anti-cubital, and three, if you're running only one presser at a low dose. So for example, if you have levofed running at less than 10 mics, you should be okay. If you can't meet these criteria, or if you're gonna require multiple infusions, then you're likely to require a central line. In critically ill adults with fever, using medications for temperature control is sometimes needed. The biggest concern of having fever in the ICU is the potential to worsen tachycardia and tachyarrhythmias. If the fever is only mild or the tachycardia is not a concern, then treatment is less warranted. But if you need to treat it, acetaminophen, Tylenol, is the go-to drug unless they're in liver failure. Just remember to aim for less than three grams per day and even lower if they have liver injury. Even before COVID-19 came around, NSAIDs such as ibuprofen are rarely given to ICU patients because these drugs have a lot of potential for side effects, including acute kidney injury, gastritis and peptic ulcer disease, and more. ICU patients are already at higher risk for getting acute kidney injury and gastritis, and NSAIDs are only gonna to add to that risk. There are some investigational agents out there that may or may not help COVID-19 patients, but routine use of standard IVIG, for example, is not suggested. And the same goes for convalescent plasma. And there's also insufficient evidence right now to recommend using antiviral agents like remdesivir, recombinant interferons, chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, and tocilizumab. What about ECMO, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation? It's a type of prolonged mechanical cardiopulmonary support that is usually delivered in the intensive care unit and is only to be performed in centers with appropriate equipment and expertise. There are about 250 hospitals in this country that can do ECMO. It's reserved for patients with severe but potentially reversible acute respiratory or cardiac failure that is unresponsive to conventional management. There are two types of ECMO. There's venovenous or VV and venoarterial VA. So VV ECMO is used in patients with respiratory failure, while VA ECMO is used in patients with cardiac failure. The most common complication of ECMO is bleeding, which occurs in about 35% of patients. Thromboembolism and cannula complications occur in less than 5%. I can tell you right now that if a COVID patient needs ECMO, it's gonna be very difficult for that patient to get ECMO because very few patients meet the criteria. And if they do meet that criteria, they have to be at a hospital that does the ECMO. And there are very few hospitals right now, if any, that are willing to accept a COVID patient from another hospital. So maybe this will change when the pandemic slows down, but right now it's highly unlikely anyone's gonna get ECMO. Normally when a patient comes to the hospital, especially when they come to the ICU, we have a discussion with the patient and our family regarding their code status. Like, do they want CPR if their heart were to stop? Do they want a breathing tube if they can't breathe on their own, etc.? And ultimately, the family and or the patient decide on whether or not they want to be full code or DNI, DNR. However, with the surge of COVID-19 patients, that's changing the decision-making process in some places. Some places have a team that decides which patients will be DNR or not. This is happening simply because resources are limited, especially with ventilators. So if this video was helpful to you, please give it a like. And if you know someone who's treating COVID-19 patients or has the potential to do so, please share this video with them as it could save a life. Thanks for watching.